Good evening and welcome to Café Politique. My name is Robert Ermel and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. To find out more about the Institute and what we do, take a look at your handbills that you found in your chair here tonight. I'd like to welcome you this evening. We're doing this in partnership with the University of Manitoba's office, uh, UMI office, University of Manitoba's international office. There we go, got it right after the third try. Um, so thank you very much to them for their support. Tonight we're discussing the internationalization of post-secondary education. Students increasingly occupy a global system of post-secondary education. Post-secondary education institutions in Canada and Manitoba facilitate the exchange of ideas through recruiting students um, to work and study internationally. What are the benefits and challenges of international student mobility in higher education? Why don't Canadian students take advantage of international educational opportunities? What role is there for governments in regulating and supporting international education here in Canada? Normally, just to allow this in very quickly, normally we would probably have somebody from the government of Manitoba on the panel tonight, um, but unfortunately there's a by-election in the PAW and they're unable to participate. But our panel this evening is made up of Ms. Ron Friesen, Mr. Gary Gervais, and Mr. Ray Karasavich. Their detailed bios can be found in your welcome papers. Our moderator this evening is Dr. David Manzuk. Dr. Manzuk is the Dean of Education at the University of Manitoba. He has been president of the Canadian Association of Foundations of Education from 2005 to 2010, and is the incoming chair of the International Council of Education for Teaching, an international NGO that brings developed and developing countries together on matters related to teacher education and education more broadly. Following tonight's event, I invite you to fill out your feedback forms. Many of our events come from your ideas. I'll now pass the mic to David to start us off this evening. Enjoy. Great, thank you, Robert. And uh, great to see such a great audience uh, tonight. Nice to see the room filled. Uh, as Robert said, I come from an educational background, not a po necessarily a po strict policy background. I spent nine years as an associate dean, and uh, now into my third year as the dean of education. I'm a firm believer in the value of international uh, experiences for students. Uh, I think through my experiences, I've started to re I've realized both the opportunities and the challenges of doing international work. Um, during my time in education, I've led a number and uh, led and initiated a number of international opportunities, including an international practicum program that we've had with a school in Bangkok, Thailand, uh, also uh, an international service learning course interprofessional service learning course that we run in the uh, favelas of Lima, Peru. That was in conjunction with uh, a Canadian NGO called Solidarity in Action. And more recently, we're working on a student exchange with the uh, Université d'Orient in France. So through all those experiences, there have been a number of um, opportunities and challenges for both uh, faculty and students. But really what I wanted to talk a little bit at the front end, just to provide sort of the context for tonight's panel, is a little bit about my experiences in being part of the drafting of the Accord on Internationalization in Education. And this accord was ratified in 2014 by the Canadian Deans of Education. It's one of six accords, uh, position papers, that have been written over the last five or six years. And I think it, I'm hoping that it will provide a bit of a uh, appropriate backdrop for some of the uh, themes and issues that might arise in the discussion. So rather than giving you the, uh, the full uh, meal deal, I think what I'm just going to talk about a bit about are some of the benefits and risks that are outlined in the Accord and then what we'll do is we'll move to the panel. So that when the Accord uh, was drafted, of course it was drafted for primarily for uh, faculties of education across the country but it was also hoped that it would provide useful guidelines for other faculties, departments within institutions of higher education, and even reference points for developing and enabling public policy more broadly. Some of the benefits that are outlined in the accord include the potential for enriching and enhancing the educational experiences of students, which you wouldn't be surprised at, would be first and foremost. The potential for increased intercultural understanding through experiences of interdependence, potential for building partnerships based on reciprocity, social accountability and sustainability, the potential for integrating learning throughout curricula, and the potential for system change through a deeper understanding of how local and global connections are connected. Uh, the, the Accord though does address a number of risks that are involved or challenges that are involved in doing international work. The first one is the risk of exploitative practices that can 
emerged from an exclusive pro a focus on profit maximization. And as you would appreciate, concerns do arise when the financial goals, goals supersede the educational research and community building goals of a program or institution. Also, the risk of systemic exclusion, and we certainly experience this in our faculty and no other institutions uh, struggle with this. A differential fee and access structures can create an issue of privilege in which only certain students, either international or Canadian, can benefit from what programs may have to offer. The risk of personal and social disruption, uh, activities that aim to intervene or build knowledge about communities without a deep critical analysis of the economic cultural and political factors that frame the positions of helpers, volunteers, and researchers can be particularly problematic. A couple more, the risk of neocolonization, which involves attempts to export educational practices and norms that are similar in their impact to enforce social and economic colonization, and may actually uh, involve the subjugation of one group to the power and control of another. And finally, the risk to participants in international activities. As it turns out, international settings with high educational needs are commonly settings with high levels of risk to personal safety and security. So institutions that engage in international practice have an obligation to protect individuals that engage in international practice. So using the Accord on Internationalization in Education as a backdrop, let's hear from our three experts on the opportunities and challenges of internationalization at the post-secondary level. Each will bring a different perspective and will take about eight to 10 minutes to share their thoughts. Robert has said that he'll play the timekeeper role, which is fine. Uh, we're gonna give you a, 10 min a two minute warning to wrap up when you get to that point. I'll ask uh, Rhonda, or Gary to start. And Gary will start, uh, be followed by Rhonda Friesen and Rhonda will be uh, followed by Ray Karasevich. And uh, I look forward to the discussion that is going to follow and uh, Right after Ray's uh, comments, I will probably pose a few questions to the panelists just to get things started, and then we'll open it up for discussion from the audience. So let's begin.